it's great to see everyone here. Uh, hopefully we can have a productive session to encourage investment into the tin industry. Um, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Jeremy Pierce. Um, Jeremy leads the ITA's market intelligence team uh, with a focus on tin uses and R&D. He has a PhD in tin chemistries and has been with ITA for over 30 years. His next presentations will pair into the future till to TIN 2030 and present an investment case for TIN. So over to you, Jeremy. Thank you, Archie. And uh, it's great to see you all here today. And uh, although I can't see you, great to see those on, on Zoom. <coughs> So our presentations today, are going, I'm going to put my presentation into, into two parts. Uh, the first part I'm going to share with you, our TIN 2030 initiative is going to be a preview of something we are going to publish more about in the, in the new year. Uh, and the second part, I'm just going to focus and zero in uh, on the topic for today, which is why should we invest in TIN, which is a message that's coming very strongly out of uh, the TIN 2030, as, as we'll see. And in between, I'll ask our time for, for questions. So what we try to do with TIN 2030 is look into the future. You know, our world is changing. Our world is changing, as we all know, very fast. And we can't stand still. We need to look into the future. We need to get past uh, uh, our uncertainties and try to work out what are, what are the key challenges and opportunities to 2030. What's the TIN industry? What's the world going to look like in 2030? And so we've Talk to a lot of people to try to get some answers to that, and we want to present here uh, a vision for tin uh, and to start a discussion really with with you, the tin industry, on yeah. on that to topic and how we can work together to adapt to those uh, challenges uh, that we all uh, see coming. So when we uh, talk to a lot of people, uh, we talk to producers, talk to our members, we talk to uh, sustainability experts, we talk to traders. Put all that together with our own own research, our own data. Uh, we came up really with uh, four themes, four groups of uh, focus and attention uh, that we felt were important uh, and roadmapped or set the map for the next decade. And this illustrated here in this, this infographic. Really, we're looking at three what we can call rings of influence, spheres of influence on the tin market, which is at the, at the center. And uh, out, out on the outer side there is, is the, the bigger ring is macroeconomics. And as we know today, especially, this is the dominant theme. Uh, this is the, a lot of turbulence in this area, lots of uh, strong drivers, climate change, market growth, geopolitics, uh, supply chains, everything is, is uh, turbulent in this area. That's going to be continuing over the next decade. And so we put a uh, stake in the sand there and said, OK, what's that going to look like? How's that going to influence tin and the supply chain? So that's, that's what we call a divided competitive world. And that's where we're going uh, in the future. Inside that, we've got the second ring, which is ESG. As we all know, ESG is becoming and going to become extremely important over the next decade. And there's, there's three sub-themes in there, and we call that securing a sustainable future. And we'll hear more about that too. When we zoom in a bit more, we get to technology. And we're going to talk a, a little bit about technology uh, this morning. Uh, technology is a, a really major driver, not just for the world, but also it's a massive opportunity for tin. And I'm going to show you why that is. And it's going to be a significant influence. I've called that a technology revolution. And in that, we can look at digitization, energy transition, some interesting sustainable or green technologies. And we're also going to address the issue of substitution, uh, if tin would be substituted in the extreme case. But inside all of that, uh, when we put all of that together, uh, we've we've seen really that in the center of these things, there, there will be a wake up for tin. People will, will eventually realize the importance of tin to uh, the world, to, uh, to uh, sustainability and the objectives that we want to achieve. And so there will be this wake up, which will have this uh, new incentive. Uh, I'm sure something you want to hear uh, for new investment, uh, for new resources, looking at exactly how the industry is structured, where tin is produced, how it's produced and of course, increased recycling. So I'm just going to quickly, uh, in just a few moments, go through the four main themes. This, as I said, is a preview of a report that you'll see in early next year. This is just a high level summary 
uh, I'll, and I'll give you some uh, some of the key themes that are coming out of this. So this is the first one I talked about in macroeconomics, a divided, a competitive world. So what is happening out there? Why are we seeing all this uh, turbulence? And it's because there's, there's several different conflicting things going on. Essentially, on economics, there's a huge change uh, in, uh, in economic uh, power. So we're seeing that the, uh, there's, a, there's a shift in, in um, GDP, a shift in growth from, uh, from west to, to east. Uh, and this is the rise of the, the emerging or the emerged economies. And they're going to grow really fast uh, over the next decade. There's going to be a 70% increase in, in global trade. India is a great example. So India is growing at, at 7% today. It's the fastest in the world. Uh, its population will overtake China uh, by next year. And on a, a purchasing power basis, it will overtake the US as the second largest economic power by 2050. So this is the kind of transitions that we're going through. And so we're seeing this, these uh, shifts in, uh, in the economics, in, in the trade interests. And that is uh, at the heart of some of the geopolitical tensions that we are seeing now. Uh, and inside that, we're now seeing the world is is breaking up from a de deglobalization into this, as we said, more competitive environment. So we're seeing resource nationalization. So on food, energy, and soon minerals, we're seeing this uh, resource nationalization. We see an example here in Indonesia with tin, as you all know, where com uh, countries are looking at the resources and how they can leverage them in these kind of ways. So that's an important driver. And we're going to see the whole world, the map of the world essentially changing over the next decade. And across that, Climate change, as we all know, is a global emergency, and that needs more and not less cooperation and some urgent issues to solve there. So it's quite a minefield, and that's why uh, it's starting to uh, really uh, meet, meet, meet the um, uh, market. So ESG, as I mentioned, is going to be really important. It's, it already is really important. It's going to become more so. So it's going to drive uh, investment, which is why we're here today. And so it's going, over the next decade, we've, there are three areas here that we have identified. One is that the, the scope of uh, ESG uh, regulation and opportunity is going to grow fast. So at the moment in tin, for example, we've been focused mainly on responsibility, uh, responsible sourcing, things like that. Uh, but it's going to be now, it's now into decarbonization. And there's a whole range of, of uh, what are called SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals for 2030, uh, that include uh, all of the E, all of the S, and all of the G. So yes, co social involvement, gender balance, uh, governance, right through the organization. And over the next decade, uh, this will permeate all of your organizations. So in organizations, uh, uh, value will be measured not just by finance, but by their ESG performance. It, the, it will run through the blood of the organization. We, we talked to a lot of people, uh, and it seems at the moment, it's still, still the case that the sustainability was dealt with by those guys down there in the corridor. Uh, that's not that's going to have to change radically uh, it's going to become an endemic part of your company and its business and at the same time we're going to have to look at how it's measured so at the moment we have audits we have certain standards and what we, we see is going to have to go way beyond that in terms of just a tick box audit it's going to have to be a holistic uh, performance-based wide-ranging uh, continuing uh, improvement kind of program we're going to need some really meaningful standards and some transparent uh, engagement uh, uh, on, on this. So that's a, a really big change on that. And to achieve that, as, as a teen industry, we're going to have to talk together a lot more. There's going to have to be a lot more discussion, a lot more collaboration between the upstream and downstream so that we all understand each other. We all got uh, much more partnerships to achieve the, this holistic goal so that we can present the tin and the tin industry to the outside world uh, and give it a, a so show that it's uh, for a sustainable future. So ESG is indeed a big theme and going to be a big theme in TIN. Coming now to technology, uh, which is my personal, as you know, some of you, uh, passion. So here we have technology is going to change the world as well. It's already changing the world. So this is really in different boxes here. So the first one I'm pointing to here is the data wave. So everything's going to become, and already becoming digitized, right? So data is going to drive the world. It already is, you know, you're already wearing a wearable, you know, you've got an Alexa at home, whatever. You, everything will have a sensor in it. And all that data, even in your washing machine or your toaster will be fed up into the cloud and there'll be uh, artificial intelligence will understand all that and feed it back down to robots and drones. Everything will be automated, especially in the factories. This is the digitization. Be, and there's a huge amount of data involved in this and a, an unthinkable amount of electronic device, devices will be needed to achieve this. And this is a great opportunity to remind everyone 
that tin is absolutely vital to this and and uh, we can show that very easily Here, here's a circuit board which most of you got in your pocket some version of this this is what drives the world all we need to do is turn it upside down look at the back can you see that silver shining at you right that's tin right so tin glues together all of your world and will glue together the future right so this is a very simple message it's ever so surprising how few people and, and people really need to understand that's tin there which is solder and you can't do any of this it will not be achievable uh, without tin so that's the data wave if we then look at uh, for example energy technologies so i'm going to talk a little bit more in my second part about solar technologies solar solar energy solar technologies is a really big uh, opportunity for tin it's already uh, a benefit so here we're looking at solar ribbon which is that silver strip you see across the solar panel that's that's tin uh, and then you're looking at a lot of other technologies uh, related to the uh, the chemistries uh, lithium-ion batteries and other things which we're looking at as well so so the energy uh, uh, technologies is another one and in the other box there we're looking at other um, chemistries other sustainable technologies water treatment for example or, or carbon capture which are going to clean up the planet there's plenty of technologies here uh, that tin is going to be involved with and uh, and we also did look at their substitution because it came out quite strongly in our uh, research uh, well what happens if the tin price does go really high will tin be substituted so we address that too so yes we think that uh, all of this put together will eventually come up with this wake up to to tin and uh, when it's realized that uh, that we, we really can't achieve uh, what we want to do even just on solar without more tin then we need to uh, look at that and so inside that box is a whole lot of interesting conversations about how that's going to happen when investors realize that uh, there is a new this huge opportunity how will it actually happen where is the tin going to be found so there's uh, a need to, to look back at the resources there's plenty of tin resources in the world as i'll show but we need to revisit that then and look at those and see wh 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 whether they can be made economic or not we see also the involvement of governments uh, governments are starting to become much more focused on this issue through critical minerals we're seeing the governments getting involved in commodities so we've, we've just looked at for example uh, america the us made a critical minerals alliance recently with the us and japan and australia to look at how the governments can secure a uh, sustainable uh, uh, supply of technology metals little that they haven't included tin in that yet they will and so governments are going to become much more involved in this and that will change the equation in terms of investment and and the dynamics of that and uh, open up and more opportunities for for the industry we think altogether you need we need 50,000 more tin uh, per year than we have at the moment for the technology super cycle we need a, a billion dollars plus investment is needed by 2030 to reach the amount of tin that we need the world needs to achieve its objectives and we're also going to have to look as i mentioned earlier at where tin is made at the moment uh, for new mines uh, there is only where, really a possibility you have to send to to uh, asia uh, your ore to buy it back as a tin in the next decade that will not even on a sustainability basis that will not be acceptable why would you do that why would you send all your ore halfway across the world and then buy it back uh, as tin so we're already talking about uh, the smelter can be built in cornwall that project is already uh, in discussion and we see that we're going to have to think about where where this uh, smelting capacity is going to be have to be built and decentralized probably in smaller scale probably using renewable technologies and other things are going to, have to be thought about but we need to localize uh, the the supply of tin much more than it is um, today and of course as i mentioned earlier um, secondary tin or, or recycled tin will become a priority and we're looking at various ways now uh, how that's going to happen and uh, for, for all those reasons we need to see more recycled tin so that's our summary uh, essentially of uh, the 2030 project uh, and uh, you'll see much more about that and i can talk to us more about that as i've said uh, and uh, there's just a few minutes i'm just going to let uh, my voice rest for five minutes and see if anybody's got any comments or feedback on just what i've said already Hi, um, Amanda Van Dyke. Given that tin, as you've said, is is the solder, it's the glue that glues everything together, how realistic is it that you can 
economically and successfully recover it in a recycling operation on a regular basis? Uh, thank you. So that's the question I've been focused on for the last five or 10 years. Um, and uh, so we've looked at lots of different ways to do that. Uh, one way uh, we investigated up in Liverpool, we detin 10, 10 tons of tin using nitric acid. Uh, you can dissolve the solder off in the whole circuit board. Uh, the components drop off. And that's, that's one way to do it called depopulation. Uh, there are many other ways. I think probably what we're seeing now actually is that it will probably come through the copper, the copper loop. So uh, copper is already uh, recovering tin from e-waste at large, large scale. And of course, they're now discovering there's some tin there uh, because of uh, its present circuit boards. And we're seeing four, four new plants are being built uh, now uh, to, to recover tin from uh, the copper, copper loop. And I think that's probably the main way it's going to happen from e-waste. Hi, thank you, Jeremy. So Dan Smith from AMT. I guess my question was kind of similar in the sense that, um, I mean, supposing we do see this kind of massive boom in terms of tin demand from the green energy transition, you know, what chance is there of a big technology shift, do you think, in the next five years? I mean, presumably if the technology exists now, we'd already know about it. So in terms of, say, a five-year view, you know, can the market really cope with a big, big shift in demand, do you think? So that's, that's my final slide of my next presentation. I'll show you the supply demand balance as we see it today. Uh, I'm not going to just spoil the, spoil the headline there <laughs> for you now, uh, but that is the great question. And it's a question that, uh, you know, is, is a moving moving target. I think that's what you, you highlighted. And, and it's, of course, the case as, as we, what we can see today, uh, the dynamics, the investment dynamics today might not be the same investment dynamics as I've indicated in 2025. And certainly by the time we get to 2030, the, the, the investment dynamics that uh, will change again uh, positively, I think, towards looking at projects that uh, that previously were considered to be unsustainable simply because we need the tin. So I think we have an answer which I'll give you, uh, and then I think that will change. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, Anthony Turner, Wildshaw. Um, my question is, you, you talked about the, the business of, of shipping concentrates to Asia for, for uh, smelting and refining um, and putting up small smelters. Well, there's excess capacity, smelter capacity in Asia, a lot of it. So, and the economics of small smelting doesn't work and it hasn't worked and it's very unlikely to work. So I don't actually see that change happening. Personally. Yes, I mean, that's, that's right. And so, and that's in fact what, what, what the discussion is about. We've certainly, there are different views on this, for sure there are. Uh, and uh, we have to, to look at that. I think that what we can see at the moment is there is a lot of smelting capacity for sure, but most of that is with integrated, integrated uh, miners who have their own, uh, their own uh, supply of ore and with the various ESG issues and so on, that's a constraint. In fact, uh, in fact, for new mines, for mines that don't have their own smelting capacity, there is a, there is a more limited supply uh, of smelters that has to go to, to, to Malaysia or, or to China at the moment, uh, and uh, mainly. Uh, and, and in Brazil, there's some capacity. But I think given, given the scale of what we're talking about, that's important. I think probably also, Tony, I would add that um, I mentioned the secondary supply. So that there was going to be more uh, resource nationalization and more need to, to bring uh, secondary uh, production uh, into, uh, into the equation. That's something being talked about in the context of this Cornish smelter project. Can, can you have the same smelter, the same production facility for, for secondary and for um, or primary and and yes there's a lot of technical problems yes it's not economic yes 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 all of those things but still i think it's a conversation that will need to be had uh, just to localize uh, localize the uh, the production i mean some of this is also related to to geopolitics as we might mention i mean we i'm not uh, we're not in the same situation for sure but uh, in the last war you know the us built a big smelter in texas and this melted more than 100,000 tons of tin it was an incredible exercise uh, because that was a kind of global emergency so i'm not saying we're getting to that place, but this is the dynamics, the conversation to have, I think. Thank you. 